This film is lit, the podcast where we finally settle the score on one simple question. Is the book really better than the movie? I'm Brian, and I have a film degree, so I watch the movie, but don't read the book. And I'm Katie. I have an English degree, so I do things the right way and read the book before we watch the movie. So prepare to be wowed by our expertise and charm as we dissect all of your favorite film adaptations and decide if the silver screen or the written word did it better. So turn it up, settle in, and get ready for spoilers, because this film is lit. A rambunctious young girl uses her imagination to escape a life that's quickly spinning out of her control. Nothing timely about this one. It's Ramon and Beezus, and this film is lit. Well, welcome back to this film. the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. On this week's episode, we're talking about Ramon and Beezus, a film based on the beloved book series... Uh, that has many different names. The Ramona Quimby series yeah. is, the, is the series of books. Uh, they only made one movie, which is kind of surprising. I wonder, I guess it must not have done very well. I didn't look at the box office for it because it was pretty quit- critically well reviewed, relatively speaking. I think it's 70 or 80%. I don't so remember, I'm surprised like, why. And kids' movies usually at least yeah. get a sequel because. I, I don't remember hearing a lot about it back in the day. So yeah. You know. I never had heard of it. I didn't even know they made it. And but kids' movies are usually pretty cheap to make too. Like I would bet the budget wasn't much. I'm just surprised that you wouldn't get a sequel. But anyways, there was no sequel. Future Brian cutting in here. Ramon and Beesus had an estimated budget of fifteen million dollars and ended up grossing worldwide twenty seven million. So not a huge success, which is probably why they didn't make a sequel. I think you normally double the budget for the estimated marketing. Probably a little less than that for a movie like this, but still didn't make a ton of money, so that's why we didn't get a sequel. So we're talking about Ramon and Quimby, the 2010 film. Uh, We don't have Guess Who this week. We're also not going to do a Let Me Sum Up because I basically did in the intro. (laughs) Like, there's not a lot of plot to this one. Mm -hmm. It's basically there's a little girl who's uh, a quirky one. Uh, She's got imagination. She's an oddball. And it's her life and, ex- and her family and their their happenings. Pretty much. But there's not a whole lot like a plot that you need to worry about knowing. Uh, I would just recommend going and watching the movie, although it's not streaming anywhere. HBO Go, I think, was the only place we found it. Anyways, we do have the rest of our segments. Uh, actually, no, we don't have lost an adaptation either because I was not confused by this children's film. So <laughs> <laughs> we do have a rather lengthy, was that in the book, better in the book, better in the movie, all that good stuff. And Katie has extensive notes about those. So we'll get to our first segment. Was that in the book? Nicholas Flamel is the only known maker of the Philosopher's Stone. The what? Honestly, don't you two read? All right. I tried to hit on some things that, t- to me, obviously felt like uh, either maybe uh, like big moments from the books that they wanted to translate to the screen or like memorable moments from the book that they wanted to translate to the screen or specifically things that I felt like definitely, I mean, this is what I always do with those that in the book, but, um, or things that I felt like definitely weren't, were like movie editions. Cause they felt like this probably wasn't in the kid's book. Now we talked about how there's what, eight of these or something books. Yes. And you read three of them in preparation I, for this movie. Yeah, I read Ramona and Beezus. I read Ramona forever and Ramona's World, and I skimmed Ramona the Brave and Ramona Quimby, age eight, to remind myself of. So I wasn't able to read Ramona the Pest, um, or Ramona and her father, or Ramona and her mother. Okay. But I read these books so often growing up, like all of them, that I'm pretty sure I picked up on everything that the movie snuck in Like I said, you're you're better in the book, better in the movie, movie nailed it moments are all very extensive and cited, so you seemed like you were very (laughs) thorough. But, uh, so, so there may be something small that you miss, uh, potentially, but chances are you, 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 you're going to remember it all here. First question uh, and this, I assume, is from the book because it kind of seems like the whole thing, the whole shtick of Ramona's character is that she imagines these fantastic c- scenarios 
Um, and in the movie, those situations play out. We see them in sort of a fantastic animated world. Like in the the first one in the in the movie is that she's on uh, the monkey bars or monkey rings, whatever those are called. Rings. I don't know. Mm-hmm. They're like monkey bars, but they're rings. And she imagines that she's hanging above a giant chasm over a river. Uh, and we see that visually in the film, uh, like animated, uh, the world turn into that. Is that scenario? Is that sort of recurring thing a part of the Ramona Quimby book series? That's well, not described the way that it's visualized in the movie, but one of Ramona's primary character traits, like you guessed, is that she has a vivid imagination. Okay, but I guess that was my kind of point: is that so we don't get it's not described in the way like the book doesn't have moments where. She imagines she's hanging over a giant chasm, and then we get like her her visualization of that. Necessary. No. Oh, okay, interesting. I would have actually thought that we did. I actually feel like, and I've always kind of felt like this, that the way the books do it, where it's it's basically it's descriptions of her playing. Yeah, and she's like get, she gets excited about like the games that she comes up with and mm-hmm. the, like the scenarios. But it's not like all of the sudden everything falls away and it becomes like a fantasy scene. Yeah. And I've always kind of felt like that's a movie thing. Like that was never my experience of imagination growing up was that I suddenly like was visualizing myself falling through the sky or dangling over a canyon. I guess that's fair. Not necessarily. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, not necessarily. But I definitely feel like at certain times when I was younger, you would. To some extent, not obviously not to in the way that it, it's visualized in like this movie or in some movies. It's hard to describe. I wouldn't say that it doesn't happen that way, though, that or that I didn't visualize certain like and especially I'm, I'm very sure, young, like, especially when I was, you know. Yeah, I'm sure like everybody experiences that differently. Yeah. Because people think differently. Everybody's yeah. brains work in yeah. slightly different ways. Yeah. But the like the way that the movies do it, that was never my experience. Well, I I will say it is interesting. I was a podcast I listened to was discussing this not too long ago. The uh, the fact that there are people who not there there are people who don't have, and we've never talked about this. This is a very brief aside. I just want to talk about for a second because I think it's relevant. I know what you're about to say. That don't have an inner monologue. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane to me. That, it's, yeah, that's insane. I have several inner monologues. Yeah, the idea of not other. hearing an inner voice in your head um, is very, it's interesting to me. And, and the fact that there are people that, that that is their experience is very fascinating to me. But it's also, so if that's your first time hearing that, apparently it's a thing. Go look it up. There's, there's research, there's all kinds of actual research about it and lots of Twitter musings about it. But um, there are some people who do not, and, and you may be one of those people, and it may be fascinating to you that there are people that do have an inner monologue that actually hear, essentially hear, quote unquote, uh, a voice in their head when they yeah. think and that sort of thing. And other people who don't, and there's people in places in between and that sort of thing. But it's also true for people visualizing things. Yes. Um, where, it, you know, some people have very vivid vi- inner, like, when you picture, I think the one I see the example a lot is like an apple or whatever, mm-hmm. but there's whatever. Um, and, you know, there's people that can visualize the, the shape and color and the details yeah, on it. Almost like a photograph. Almost like a photograph. Like an apple, and then other people see like more like a cartoon apple and more or like something. A, the, the idea of an apple. Yeah, like a little sort more vague. vague or impressionistic in And a some way. people apparently don't have any sort of yeah. inner visualization, which, again, I can't fathom. Because for me, uh, both are fairly strong. The yes. both the inner monologue and the inner visualization. I, I would. I don't know where I would be. You know, in the scale. But I think I'm higher, or I'm not higher. So not the right word. But yeah. more towards the visualizing and more towards the inner monologue side by a significant amount. Um, but so, anyways, uh, I think maybe that would also depend a little bit in terms of the like, like how much you that you identify with the way movies portray sort of like imagining things as a kid may mm-hmm. vary based on your inner visualization, your inner like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would think so. And it, and it wouldn't surprise me if filmmakers are significantly towards the very high detailed inner mm-hmm. visualization so that they would then use or depict that in film more often, if that makes sense. You know yeah, what I mean? Potentially. Again, not that it would be exactly how, obviously, it, you're not, like, literally seeing, the you know, a giant chasm underneath you, mm-hmm. but in a way, kind of, because we're not literally seeing anything. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, anyways, that was a, a, a yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is a moment in the movie that I thought was cute and uh, I thought was a very child thing to do that I can envision myself doing when I was a, a kid was that they're getting an addition added to their house and, and the construction people knock a hole in the side of the house to build on off of. And after the construction people leave, Ramona and her neighbor um, just take turns jumping out of the hole in the side of the house because they think it's fascinating and hilarious that there's a hole in the side of their house and of course you're going to jump out of a hole in your house i mean it's just a door that's a door is also just a hole in your house but it's different <laughs> it's different and the door I is supposed to be there and the door is supposed to be there and it is very different especially when you're a kid that's a very different thing uh was that something that happens in the book yeah okay <laughs> that's fun i didn't know if it would be from the book or not but whatever the, it was one of those moments that i thought and i felt this way several times throughout the course of the movie that felt like a very distinct and accurate depiction of what it's like to be a kid that doesn't always translate that you don't always see in movies mm -hmm. like a little thing like that felt very real to me and again i can imagine being a kid and jump and it because it doesn't it makes no sense it's not but for <laughs> some reason the idea of jumping out of a hole in your house it's not normally there is like very compelling as a kid <laughs> like yeah. there's something about it that just is very compelling and and way more fun than it should be this is a particular line that i wanted to know about because it was a, a funny line and it made me chuckle um and i I don't know exactly. I assumed this felt more like a movie line, but uh, at one point they're talking about this is after her dad, their their dad, Ramon and Beez's dad loses his job, and they're talking about needing money and that sort of thing. And Beez's says, "Have you seen how many bills they get? Everything costs money, even water." And I, I this is a silly little line, but it made me chuckle. Is that line from the book? So the kids worrying about the family's financial situation is a theme for several of the books, actually, like almost all of them, I think. Yeah. I don't recall that specific line being okay. in any of the books, though. It felt more like a more modern comedy line. Yeah. Than a 1960s or whenever yeah. type of line. So we spoke about her dad loses his job in the movie. I and mean, is that a thing that happens in the book? And then after that, uh, is that like a... You said that they have recurring tension about where the money and that sort of thing. Um, but is it because dad loses his job and then does Ramona embark on a series of fun adventures trying to make money for her family? So the dad does lose his job in Ramona and her father. And I mentioned that I didn't get to reread that one because I just wasn't able to access it. Yeah. Thanks, COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I don't remember any similar like money making schemes happening okay. in any of the books though. That felt like a very 50s or 60s book. Th that felt like a a classic kid storyline that wouldn't surprise me to be in the book. Yeah. Like and oh I, I the parents like need money I, I and I'm going to go start a uh, remembered it. A lemonade stand or I'm going to go wash cars and that you know that just felt very classic. Mm -hmm. Um so it wouldn't it's interesting that it's not in the book. Uh, Hobart. Let's talk about Hobart, the handsome weirdo. Is he? Uh, is he in the book? And uh, is he courting Snow White? Hobart is from the <laughs> books. So is Aunt B. They do get married, although we don't see their relationship develop like oh, we do in the movie. Okay. So yes. we don't watch them court. We don't presumably, see them rekindle their. Yeah, presumably they have a courtship because they do get married. They do get but, married, but we don't see any yeah. of it. We're not akin to it. Is there any tension between? And I don't think I ask about this. Uh, is there any tension between uh, Ramona and Hobart in the books? Uh, because in the movie, there's a kind of a theme. There's like she likes him, but also there's this tension where uh, she, you know, she likes her aunt B a lot and doesn't want to like lose time with her. And so, like, she sees Hobart kind of as stealing, especially stealing her away in the sense that they're going to move to Alaska, mm -hmm. um, which we won't have to get into whether or not that's in the book, but. Uh, is there any of that tension between her and Hobart? I wouldn't say that there's tension like there is in the movie. She doesn't really worry about like, oh, I'm going to lose my aunt. Yeah. Like, the tension in the book is more that she doesn't, at least at the beginning of Ramona Forever, she doesn't really care for Hobart because he's the type of adult who teases kids. Mm. So she doesn't mm. really like him all that much. So she doesn't like her whole family then, because <laughs> at least in the movie, they all just nonstop tease her 
which I also thought was an interesting. I don't really, I don't really have a lot of notes about it, but I thought it was an interesting portrayal. I thought the movie did a pretty good job of, of, of depicting that reality of like the one kid who's kind of unique and like the the older people all like find her endearing and funny, but she doesn't understand that yet. And mm-hmm. so she's frustrated by being laughed at all the time. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting thing that the movie did. Um, and that they, they kind of, it, and it's not, she doesn't just grow to like, Ramona doesn't just grow to like understand, you know, what they're laughing about and deal with it. They, they actually kind of grow to, to realize not maybe, I don't know the way to describe it, but they, they sort of. Um, I mean, they apologize to her several times and like, oh, we're not laughing at you and that sort of thing. But I think they kind of by the end of the film come to a place where they realize that maybe they shouldn't shouldn't do that as much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. There's a lot of little details in this movie that I thought felt really realistic um, and were really well written uh, in a movie where nothing happens. So, (laughs) I mean, I, I quite liked the movie. I thought it was very cute and I thought it was a very like well made film as well made as you can make a film where literally nothing happens mm-hmm. or nothing like really happens. I have some thoughts about that. Later I, but, on. but I'm not saying that as a negative. I actually think that's a plus of the film that, that they were able to make as compelling and well, uh, sort of well written of a film that even has sort of a structure that makes sense. Um, it's the pacing is a little weak in the second half of the movie. I thought, I thought they could have wrapped things up a little quicker, but, uh, I did think that it was a, a really well made film where again, that to do nothing and still have it be as compelling and interesting and sort of fun as it was, was mm-hmm. cool. Uh, at one point, uh, Hobart, he's home to get his Jeep because he needs his Jeep to go to Alaska. And he, uh, Ramona's one of her money making schemes is she's doing car washes and she's washing his car. And then some nonsense happens where she knocks out a, a his, it's up on blocks and she knocks out the thing holding it up and it rolls into the garage and for some reason Hobart has 800 million gallons of paint in his garage. Of like luridly colored of, paint. Of neon too. paint. Yeah, that, that felt like that needed some background. <laughs> <laughs> like, felt like he could have, you know, like there could have been a one on maybe there was and I missed it about some line about him uh, being an artist in his past life or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or, or painting houses. Or, I don't even know. Whatever. But there's some, all this paint and it, uh, his car ends up coming out like a uh, tiger. Sh- that, what's that gum? That terrible gum that loses its flavor. <laughs> zebra stripe. Zebra stripe gum. <laughs> His car comes out. It gets dumped in paint and looks like zebra stripe gum. Uh, is that in that scene in the book? No, that's not from the books. It's a cute moment where he's he's upset about it, but then uh, he you know he kind of he decides he likes it and to make Ramona feel better and not because she's really upset you know and feels really bad and mm-hmm. he kind of. Soothes that over. Uh, it's me a moment later in the movie where after uh, the dad loses his job, he's home all day, and Ramona's home sick. She's not feeling well, and he wants to do something with her to make her feel better. And what they do is he's like, let's paint them, make the longest drawing in the whole world. And they sit, and they roll out a giant sheet of paper, um, and they, they draw a big mural. Um, it's a cute scene, but... Uh, and it's one of their bonding moments is because they bond over art because their dad went to art school and was an artist. Uh, is any of that storyline from the book? Ramona and her dad being artistic together and like both having that talent and bonding over that is present through several of the books, but I don't recall the specific longest picture in the world story element yeah. from any of them. That's interesting too, because that also feels like it would have been something for, that feels like a classic kids book thing. Like, and I could be wrong. I, mean? I could be missing. I'm not saying you are. Yeah. But I don't remember it being a plot point. All right. It's not really a plot. I mean, it doesn't yeah, really. Yeah, like a plot element. Yeah, it, it kind of like comes up and then they do it. And then it, as a result of that, she takes into class and then her dad gets a job as a teacher kind of-ish yeah. as a result of it. But yeah, it, yeah, it's not really that important. But uh, at one point uh, she's auditioning. Uh, Ramona goes to audition for a commercial to be a princess something like a peanut butter princess some 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 sort of yeah mascot for something (laughs) and yeah for some sort of peanut butter and uh she gets there and every other girl has a tiara because they're it's a princess audition and she needs a tiara but she doesn't have one so she decides to make one and she makes it out of uh burrs that she finds in in like in the 
bushes uh, out in front of this place where they're doing the audition. And so she builds a giant uh, crown out of burrs and sticks it in her hair. Uh, and it's very it's very endearing. But is, is that in the book? Uh, yes, kind of. She does make a crown out of burrs, but she doesn't wear it to an actual audition for a commercial. She does fantasize about earning money for her family by acting in commercials. Because oh. her dad has a similar line in one of the books about like, oh, that's the way to make money. Yeah, or that's, the, like that. that's the, yeah, whatever she says. Whatever yeah. he says. Um, so she does like think about like, oh, maybe I could do that, but she never actually goes in auditions for a commercial. So they took that and they expanded it. Into yes. A, that's a, yeah, that's a clever way to kind of combine a couple little elements there. Uh, is there a giant, they, not giant, but they start a, in one moment in the movie that I the laughed at probably the most because it's just, was really funny to me, uh, is Ramona's trying to cook and she accidentally starts a fire and then she tries to put the fire out with a broom and then the broom catches fire and she's waving it around in the kitchen and they're all screaming and it's way over the top and it's kind of like a classic like early 2000s like comedy yeah like scene like a wacky hijink scene but it still was very funny to me because it looked and and i guess they figured out a way to do it safely because it looked sure looked to me like that eight-year-old night however i think joey king was like 10 or yeah. nine when she filmed this was actually waving around a flaming <laughs> broom in the in the kitchen it sure looked real to me i didn't look like it was you know i mean CG it looked or, real to me I, yeah it probably had like 10 different people, people standing yeah, I, there with even them. still i was like wow that's i and and you know that's the kind of thing you'd see in a movie in the 70s or 80s they could get away with but nowadays they're a little more uh it's a little tougher to kind of I, like yeah. i remember like when we watch like uh brooklyn 99 that half the time they light fires on that show and they're it's cg fires and there's not even any kids around so i was like <laughs> i don't know <laughs> I don't know, maybe, okay. Um, and I assume it's just for, like, insurance reasons or whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> So I was, like, really impressed and surprised that it looked like she was actually, a little kid was waving an actual flaming broom around in the in the kitchen. Uh, is that scene in the book? It's not. Okay. <laughs> so they just invented a, a reason to get sued. <laughs> uh, so they have a cat in the book, uh, or in the movie, whose name is, I think, Picky Picky yeah, is what picky, they call picky. it. Yeah, Picky Picky. Uh, and the dad misname misnomers it uh, routinely as a joke. Um, but at one point in the movie, uh, the cat dies, um, and and uh, Ramona has to come to terms with that. Uh, and it's after a low point between her and her sister. It's right after the fire, and her sister's yelling at her, and it's like you you ruin everything, you suck. And then Ramona goes to feed the cat, and the cat's dead. And it sort of brings them back together after the kind of on a low sh- it's an emotional low point and another emo- lower emotional low point uh, and but then that causes them to kind of come back together uh does the cat die in the book <laughs> that, <laughs> One is, of the books. that is from the books yeah um and that's from ramona forever and i don't know if you caught me say oh no oh, while we were watching it because no. i realized as soon as bezos told her to go feed the cat that they were putting that in the movie i was yeah. like oh, oh no, no. <laughs> dead cat yeah, that's a tough part uh, of, of childhood that I, this movie does hit a lot of like, I mean, that's one of the things that I thought was kind of funny about the movie. It kind of laundry lists like every tough thing to deal with as a kid, or mm-hmm. at least because the only thing they really don't, she doesn't actually deal with, quote unquote, is like her parents actually getting divorced, but they like are worried. they're gonna. She's yeah. like worried, you know, and so it's like it kind of goes down the checklist of like pet dying. Uh, your sibling uh, not, you, is older than you and you guys don't get along anymore. Oh, you're going to move. Oh, your your dad doesn't have a job. So you're kind of poor now. Oh, your parents are fighting. They might get a divorce. Oh, oh, your your favorite aunt who you're best friends with is moving away. And, and it's like, oh, my God, they just like go down the list. And I did think that was kind of funny but i thought they did it in a, a way that may felt natural enough that in the moment watching the movie i didn't feel like it was hitting a checklist but in retrospect thinking about it it's kind of funny how it is like everything but i think it's really good because it is an effective way to put all of that stuff in there so that any kid watching this can pick out sort of yeah sort of one like, of oh, those situations right, thing that i've had this is the thing with. that i've dealt with or you know you, you, so you hit a broad spectrum of things and then that way every kid kind of has at least something they can <laughs> you yeah, know identify yeah. with so we've watched the courtship of uh aunt b and hobart over the course of the film and then finally uh he's gonna propose to her their relationship in the movie has its ups and downs and we don't really see all the details of it but eventually uh he's he's pro- He's looking for something in his yard, and it turns out 
she's kind of their their whole deal has been that she's uh, never felt like that he wanted to commit to her and that he didn't actually care as much as he said you know and that sort of thing and that's kind of why they broke up in the first place and blah 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 turns out he's been he turns out he was actually saving all these trinkets from their relationship and had them buried in a shoebox in his mom's yard like a yeah, psychopath kind of, i kind of <laughs> wish they would have explained why it was buried in the yard I, I, but I, I, whatever he, sure and so he i mean so we can see him digging holes in the yard over the course of the film and try to figure out what the heck he's up to because he's so I quirky guess. and it turns out he was just looking for the <laughs> so box. quirky with his hat yeah oh the hat um and but so he finds the box and it has the ring from prom or whatever doesn't matter uh but he so and, but they have a big water fight before this which is fun and uh all the they turn on all the sprinklers the sprinklers go off water everywhere it's raining or sprinklering all over them and he proposes to her with a, a gumball ring in mm-hmm. the sprinklers it's a very movie moment is that a movie moment that is a movie yeah. moment. we don't see the proposal in the books gotcha so how about the fact that like i said all of these uh the culmination of all of these changes and uh all this turmoil at once hitting all at once uh, i'm guessing that this that a lot of these plot lines that we get kind of all at once with the dead cat and the and the aunt getting married and moving and dad trying to find a job and uh, her, her and her sister growing apart, and uh, blow all the things I've mentioned, are maybe spread throughout the course of the books. In the movie, we get all of this stuff kind of like whoop, all coming to a head at the very end of the, or you know, at the end of the second act or into the middle of the third act of this movie, and that's kind of what drives Ramona to run away because she's like, ah, um, she can't take it anymore. Is that what happens in 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 any of the books? Is there any like sort of that? culmination of all of these stressful events leading to her running away or are these multiple storylines plucked from wait are we talking about her running away right now well I, I guess i'm talking about just like the culmination of all these events at once and then her like not being able to deal with it and not necessarily the running away part but just like it's a lot it's more spread out in the books i think a lot of those things our stressors in Ramona forever. That's mm-hmm. where we have um, the wedding and also the cat dying. Her dad having like no employment or shaky employment is, like I said, in several of the books. Yeah. It's kind of throughout most of the series. So that stressor is present at the mm-hmm. same time as those other things, but it's not as much of a stressor as yeah. it is in the movie. Yeah. Um, but there's there's no moment where like everything culminates. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. And then uh, the the thing that happens after that is that I forgot, I forgot this is the next part of my note is that she falls through the ceiling during their house showing when they're trying to sell their house. Mm-hmm. Does that happen in the book? No. Oh, well, kind of. There is a scene in Ramona's world where she falls through the lath and plaster and like dangles halfway out of the ceiling, but it actually happens at a friend's house. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And there's never a we might have to sell our house. Oh, stressor. Yeah, in the books. So they weren't. It was we were selling our house because Dad got a job. In, right. You know, hours away, so we're gonna move. And there is in Ramona's world. There's a mention of he gets a job offer that's far away, and they talk about it. Like they talk about potentially like renting their house, like subletting it, and going to live. Um, like halfway across the state for a while and then coming back if he can get a better job but it it never happens it never happens in the movie either so but it's not it's not like as big of a thing in the book like they talk about it a little bit but it's not a main like yeah kind of big point gotcha of of stress gotcha uh, and then, so ultimately, she after the all these events take place, uh, she's she's like, all right, well, it, it was you guys would be way better off without me. I'm running away, and she packs up her bag, and her mom just helps her pack, and she she goes out and she leaves, and she makes it all the way to a bus stop. And this is less of a question, but man, they really uh, that was a heck of a gambit by the mom to let her daughter, <laughs> her her eight year old daughter, just go and gets all the way to a bus stop uh before they catch up with her and find her uh and she could have got on a bus and been gone but yeah she doesn't uh does that happen in the book there is a scene in ramona and her mother where ramona similarly wants to run away from home but it plays out pretty differently she definitely doesn't make it all the way to the bus stop gotcha 
that was weird. I was like, it was a little bit. And now when they ended it, and then her family's like right there in the car, I was like, okay, maybe they were just like driving well, that, away behind that's her. That's what I thought. Time. No, but that's not the vibe. Oh, that's what I was thinking originally is that we we're going to find out that they had been following her the whole time. Mm -hmm. But the way it plays out is she's like, they're like, where are you on the walkie talkie? And she's like, I'm somewhere. Oh, and then yeah. they like pull up. Like, I, cause then I was like, oh, so they weren't just like, cause that's what I thought. Like, oh, they got in the car and they're like, you know, a block behind her. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the vibe I got mm -hmm. eventually when it was revealed when they pull up and they, and they catch up with her. They seemed not to have been like right behind her the whole time that they actually just let her wander off and then tried to go find her eventually because they knew she had a walk because she had the baby monitor or whatever. I, it was very strange. I was, yeah, that's it was a little bit of an odd bad parenting. I was like, oh, they're really letting her leave, huh? Yep. <laughs> and then I love her. Ramona's like, you put heavy stuff in my bag so I couldn't get very far. It's like she could have just left the bag and kept going. I, but sure, <laughs> like I said, it's, a, it's an interesting gambit by the mom there. Uh, but sure. And then finally, does dad become uh, the art teacher at Ramona's elementary school? No. That was felt like a nice little movie cherry on top. top yeah, right? definitely was a, a movie cherry on top. Yeah. And he's like, it's only part time. I'm like, eh, you're, you're going to leave that full time good job a couple hours away to take a part time teacher. All right. I mean, sure. I guess if you guys have the money to do that, <laughs> like seems fine. like they don't though. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh, all right, if you if you think you can do that, that was all I had for was that in the book. Like I said, we don't have lost in adaptation because I was not perplexed by this film. Let's go ahead and talk about what was better in the book. You like to read? Oh yes, I love to read. What do you like to read? Everything. Well, the first thing I want to talk about is Ramona's scene where she says a bad word. Mm -hmm. She says guts and her family laughs at her. Yeah. Because it's kind of a silly idea of a bad word when you right. know worse words. Yes. But it is certainly a rude word. I actually don't think that the movie does as good of a job at capturing like the emotional honesty and rawness of what it's like to be a kid and have nobody take you seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think probably I think I think a big part of that is because the books are told in third person limited. So we're seeing from Ramona's point of view. And I think that the books, the narrative does a really good job of capturing like how frustrating it is to be trying to express yourself and to be feeling things that are very valid. Yeah. But just you know, nobody's taking you seriously because they're adults and they felt it before and they just don't remember. Right. I will say it's funny you say that, that, that you put this in better in the book because that's the feeling I got from the movie. Yeah. Having that never read any of the books. Me. Having never read any of the books or know anything about like that. Like I got that from the movie and it felt very well done to me. Now, I believe Beverly Cleary did work on the screenplay. I think I saw that on okay. IMDb. I don't remember saying that, but. It could um, be. Uh, it's possible. A lot of times, though, on I, if you saw it on IMDb, you have to be careful what it says because the, they'll get a credit just for that's fair. The yeah, book just being, for having written yeah. the book. I don't think the movie did a bad job, and obviously it didn't because you still yeah, got that. I from felt it. that a lot, and I think a lot of that has to do with Joey King's performance, which we'll talk about. Uh -huh. But um, I thought I, I got yeah, I got that. I just it. felt that the books did it better. And that's fair. I can't argue with you because didn't read the book. <laughs> you know. Yeah, Beverly Cleary doesn't have a. All right, well, she's never credited mind on for that the novels, okay. which that's just means yeah, that's just the standard. Like you wrote the book, so you get a movie credit or you get a credit. One character that was left out of the movie was Ramona's best friend Daisy from Ramona's World, and I get why she was cut, but I was kind of hoping she would at least be in like a quick scene. We would see her, or there would be a reference to her or something. But I don't think there was. If there was, I didn't catch it. What's important about their relationship? It was just a relationship that I enjoyed, like reading the books growing up, because um, she never really had like a close friend who was a girl, and then she kind of gets that relationship in the last book. Yeah. Maybe that was if they were going to get a sequel eventually. They were. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Maybe they had big plans. Yep. <laughs> There's a scene in Ramona Quimby, age eight, where Ramona and Beezus have to cook dinner for the family after complaining about their mother's cooking. 
and of course hijinks ensue. Um, I thought that was where the kitchen fire scene was going to go initially, um, but then it went to fire <laughs> instead of them cooking and like messing it up. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, but I think that could have potentially been a good movie scene, yeah. like trying to cook dinner and making a mess. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of where they go with the yeah the fire scene is just a little more over the top. Mm-hmm. And but the I think the yeah in that one it's not because they complained about her cooking. Mm-mm. And like have to, they they're cooking because I think Ramona is cooking because her mom they their mom's stressed or is working or whatever. Yeah, she's, she's like, like at work still. Yeah, so she's gonna help out. So when Ramona tries to run away, her mom packs her suitcase for her, and we we watch her pack the whole thing. Um, so Ramona knows everything that she's putting into it, and she packs it too heavy so that Ramona actually can't leave. Like, she packs it heavy enough. Oh, so she literally can't even take it up. She can't even, like, pick it up. Gotcha. And then that's how Ramona knows that her mom wants her to stay there. Gotcha. And wants her around. Because I was about to say, when I read this, I was like, this is in the movie. It's just slightly different in the movie. I mean, because this is what happens in the movie. Her mom puts all the stuff in, and Ramona realizes, like, again, now it's not too heavy that she can't leave. She's able to get a ways. But she does say after that, she goes, oh, you put all that heavy stuff in there, so I could. Ramona does realize. She realizes eventually. Yeah. I felt like the, the movie scene was weird to me. I felt like it was a gambit in two ways. Like, one, you're gambling that your kid might actually get on the bus and vanish. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I feel like it's also a big gambit with, like, her emotional well-being. Because they actually let her leave. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of one of those, like, more, like, 90s parents things to do, I feel like, of, of okay, go ahead then. Yeah. Type of thing. And then... The having the kid learn that lesson on their own kind of thing. I don't. I'm not a parent, and I don't know what the best way to go about handling that situation <laughs> is. So I can't really even begin to comment. But uh, I think that's what they were going for. And then, it, I like I said, I can't. I can't compare to what happens in the book, but it is what happens in the movie. The same thing. It just plays out slightly differently because mm-hmm. it is Ramona eventually realizing, oh, you put all that heavy stuff in there so that I couldn't get very far. It's just she can get a ways. She goes a ways, and then it becomes too heavy. But even then, it's not too heavy. She's at the bus stop. She, it's, yeah. She just decides in that moment not to leave because she opens it up. I guess because she realized it was heavy. I don't know. It's a little, yeah, it's a little muddy. So I can see your point that in the movie, maybe it's or in the book, it's it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. In the movie, I think it's they're going for a little bit more of a dramatic moment. Mm-hmm. of her actually getting to the bus stop and having to make that decision and you know what I mean yeah, I get not it. she's going to get on the bus so yeah in Ramona Forever which is the book that the wedding takes place in we actually get some like wedding planning like build up to the actual wedding not just their relationship so we get to go dress shopping with Hobart mm. which is an interesting scene um there's also a kind of a funny scene in the book where they get the bridesmaids dresses and they're too long because they, you know, of course, ordered them quickly. Uh-huh. Um, so Beezus has to hem them really quickly. And Ramona's like, I don't trust your stitches. So she reinforces hers with scotch tape, which I kind of thought would make it into the movie because that seems like a movie thing to me. Yeah. Like something that they could show quickly. Now I'm feeling like there was a reference to Am I crazy? That I don't remember. I don't remember I, there being maybe a there reference wasn't, to that. For some reason, that when you saying something about scotch tapes and hems was sticking out in my head that that was a thing, but I don't, I don't actually remember any explicit <laughs> details of it, so probably not. So my last thing here, I guess it's not necessarily a better in the book per se it's just a thing that i don't really understand about the movie why did they call this movie ramona and beezus isn't that what the first book's called well the first book called beezus and and ramona Ramona. yeah i assume they thought people had read would recognize that name maybe i don't know i feel like it was to make them feel better about putting selena gomez on the poster that too yeah that that's very fair because they got like when they i mean selena gomez i think at this point had been in like yeah what, she what, was like, like a disney, disney channel star yeah. type of thing recognizable so, yeah so th- so i'm sure that that was part of it is that if they put her on the poster 
and call it, then it feels like, you know, to a certain market, they can advertise her a little harder. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me because the series of books, there is a book about her and each family member, aside from her baby sister who doesn't show up until the very last book. But there's uh, Beezus and Ramona, there's Ramona and her father, and Ramona and her mother. And those books do focus specifically on her relationship with each family member. But the movie is not really about her and Beezus's relationship. Yeah. Like, that's part of it. There are elements of that, but it's not the focus of the movie at all. No, it's... I, I not. I, it's as much a focus as anything is. Yeah. Kind of in terms of like a specific thing. I mean, the Ramona is the focus. And that is why we mentioned at the prequel, they changed it from Beezus and Ramona to Ramona and Beezus. And it's why they put mm -hmm. Ramona first. But yeah, it's not like the main. I mean, the main focus of the movie is Ramona dealing with. Yeah. All of these things. And I mean, life. I even think it would have made, been more accurate to call it Ramona and her father. But, but that's a terrible title. It for is a, a terrible movie. title for a movie. But I mean, if they wanted to keep a book title, they could have called it Ramona Forever, because that's where the whole wedding. That plot would have been the third from. in the series. <laughs> that would have been the last. That would have yeah. been the. That's how you come on now. <laughs> that and I think that's where they would have went with it. I think you're not wrong that they're marketing, uh, sell putting so they can put they're calling it Ramona Biza so they can put Selena Gomez on the poster and sell her a little bit more because she's a bankable name and Joey King's an eight year old girl who's been in like CSI or something mm -hmm. like an episode, and so that's why they did it. But then if it was successful enough and they made sequels, we were gonna get Ramona the Brave would probably have been the second one, mm -hmm. and Ramona Forever probably would have been the third one. Yeah. They probably would have used those titles because that's good. That 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 that, that is like classic trilogy naming conventions <laughs> it feels like to me you know what i mean yeah by having ramona the brave be feel like a good follow-up like it's a good strong title for a second movie and then ramona forever is a great one to end it on because it's, it leaves you with that sort of lasting i all right <laughs> i see your point i do think ramona the brave makes more sense thematically as a title than yeah ramona you're and right Beezus does you're not wrong but they weren't thinking thematically they were thinking as movie producers and, <laughs> and marketing people so all right that was it for better in the book let's go ahead and talk about better in the movie my life has taught me one lesson hugo and not the one i thought it would happy endings only happen in the movies I thought they made some improvements to the character of Howie, her that, her, friend, her friend, the yeah, neighbor. her friend the neighbor, like Hobart's nephew, or yes, something like yeah. That? Uh, in the books, he's kind of like a perpetual stick in the mud. He's kind of like the boring character, he's like the straight man, to, yeah, yeah, to Ramona's colorful and vibrant character. Right. So I, I kind of appreciated that they didn't have him be quite as bland yeah. i thought the scene where aunt b gave ramona the locket was nice in the books it's really bezos and aunt b who have like a close relationship mm -hmm. but i thought it made sense for the two younger sisters yeah. to have that relationship instead bezos and henry never have anything even approaching romantic in the books but all things considered i think that makes sense mm -hmm. the childhood best friend come back into the picture as a romantic interest which also mirrors aunt b and uncle hobart yeah and it, i thought it was also nice that the movie managed to keep it like as a little thing yeah and then it didn't like take over yeah as a nice little something for the older kids in the audience yeah you know because yeah. a lot of this is like uh, much more identifiable and much more sort of relatable for you know six to ten yeah. year olds so and that's, a nice thing for all of the beezuses who yeah, got dragged to the yeah, movie theater exactly yeah throwing a bone to the beezuses out there it was me i was the beezus <laughs> <laughs> i also liked that the movie showed us aunt b and hobart's relationship develop i think it makes sense that we don't see any of it in the book because why would we yeah um it's from the point of view of Remember. an eight nine-year-old yeah. girl like why would we be privy to all of their relationship yeah. but it was nice to see it because i will say that in the book their engagement comes out of nowhere <laughs> yeah left field all the way huh like they they meet uncle hobart and it's mentioned that 
uh, Aunt B knew him in school. And then, like, at the end of the book, they're like, we're going to get married and move to Alaska. And you're like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Fun. Setting the broom on fire. Um, it's kind of a classic tropey comedy scene, but I thought it was also a pretty good Ramona scene. It's not from the books, like I said, but I think it maybe could have been. Easily could have been. Yeah. I thought it was nice that her dad gets a job as an art teacher. Uh, he does go to school to try to get a job as a teacher at one point, but I th- the last we hear in the books, I think he's managing a grocery store. Oh. So that never actually pans out for him. Yeah, that's depressing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's more realistic. Yeah, maybe more but... <laughs> realistic. Not quite such a happy ending. You're yeah. Like, oh, I get to go be a, be a, be a part-time art teacher. Part-time art teacher in elementary school, right? my family with a part-time <laughs> art teacher I job. guess the mom's going to keep working I guess she's going to keep working scenario. and got a... And got a a pretty because she was also working Mm part-time i find it hard to believe you're raising two kids three kids three kids uh on i mean you could do it people do it 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 would just be very difficult um to raise three kids on a part-time two part-time incomes like well where are they getting health insurance yeah (laughs) you can't have a baby and not have health insurance Uh, yeah maybe this is some magical fairyland where part-time job people are getting (laughs) reasonable health insurance to their employer it is on the west coast so it's not outlandish Mm. that some employers might be giving a reasonable health insurance to part-time employees i don't know like because they're in like california right or oregon or yeah they're in oregon or washington because yeah they talk about going to the so anyways it i don't know i'm (laughs) guess i'm just spitballing i have no idea (laughs) And I thought it was also nice to see, like, the minor conflict with her teacher kind of wrapped up. I think it's probably, again, more real life to have that be a loose end. You don't always get along with your teachers, and that's not always something that's resolved. But it is a nice moment at the end that they have. Sort of a mutual respect. Mm -hmm. All right. That was it for uh, Better in the Movie. Let's go and talk about what the movie nailed. As I expected, practically perfect in every way. So this is where you said I've cited my sources. Yeah, I've got got (laughs) lots of sources here. I'm just going to run down a list. Rapid fire style. tell you guys what book these various things were pulled from. I love it. Let's do it. Ramona and the Rings on the Playground. That's from Ramona's World. Does she get caught upside down on her feet? No. Okay, but she's on the rings. But she is, That's yeah, that's like a thing that she does. Okay. She practices on the rings. And um, the calluses, gotcha, like yeah, wanting to build up calluses, anyway. that's yeah. a thing too. Mrs. Kemp, the mean old grandma next door, and Willa Jean, that's present in all of the books, but comes to a head in Ramona forever. Uh, which one's Willa Jean? Is that the one on the The little scooter? girl on the tricycle. Oh, the, or, yeah. yeah, on the big wheel. Mm-hmm. Ramona teaches Roberta to stick out her tongue. Mm-hmm. That's from Ramona's world. Beezus, the responsible good kid. All the books. All the books. Ramona says a bad word. Guts. Ramona the brave. Mrs. Meacham is obsessed with spelling. Ramona's world. Ramona squeezes out an entire tube of toothpaste into the sink. Ramona and her mother. Yeah. Always wanted to do that. Side note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just think it would be satisfying. Oh, that's fair. You know, they make Play-Doh. You can just, like, go it's put not Play-Doh the, through. It's not the same. Well, I mean, like, if you get Play-Doh and put it through, like, the presses, that's kind of similar. No, yeah. no, no, no. I think no, it is. I no. think it is. Jumping through the hole in the house, Ramona the Brave. Dad loses his job, Ramona and her father. Roberta blows peas all over Ramona, Ramona's world. Uh, Ramona breaks a raw egg on her head, Ramona Quimby, age eight. Say peas and then a terrible school picture, Ramona's world. Ramona puts on clothes over pajamas like a fireman, Ramona the pest. Getting sick at school, Ramona Quimby, age eight. Ramona makes a crown out of burrs, Ramona and her father. Picky Picky dies and the girls have to bury him while their parents are at work, Ramona forever. Ramona falls halfway through the lath and plaster, Ramona's world. Ramona saves the wedding ring from being stuck on Aunt B's heel, Ramona forever. I was going to ask about that because that had I knew that had to be from the book because it was such a weird little detail yeah. that I felt like that has to be from the book that they put in there just for book. Re- because like she they dropped the ring and they can't find it. 
And then it's somehow on her heel. And I was like, what is, yeah. how in the world did this happen? I mean, happen? I guess the idea is that, like, she steps on it. Well, no, it I know. Gets, but they but don't show her moving They don't show anything, her moving, so, and it somehow yeah. bounced under her heel. It's just very strange. And it, I was like, and it, it's filmed kind of awkwardly. And, and I get parsed sort of thematically. The point is because, like we said, there's been this tension between um, Ramona and Hobart the whole time. And then her finding the ring and giving it to him is kind of like... Mm-hmm. And they had they share a little moment, and it's kind of like they're resolving their like slight tension and blah blah blah. It's kind of Ramona giving her blessing <laughs> for the wedding, basically, because <laughs> she could just she sees the ring and nobody else does. She could just be like, "Well, guess the wedding's off," and sort of, sort of a growth of her character, to, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it, I knew that had to be from the book because it was such a weird little detail that it was on her heel, anyways. So that was my long list of things that were directly from the books. Yeah. I also have a shorter list of stuff that was referenced in the movie. Uh, there's a mention of wearing pajamas to be a sheep in the Christmas mm-hmm. play, Ramona and her father, a reference to Jesus Beezus, which is from Ramona the Brave, uh, pulling Susan's hair, her curls, and saying I boing. Gonna, I almost said that that had to be from the book because yeah. that felt like a book thing. That's from Ramona the Pest. Such a weird little detail. Also, Ramona's red rain boots. I knew that was from the book. From Ramona the Pest. And Ramona tying her shoes to the back of the car. Is For the in, wedding. Uh, at the wedding, yeah, in Ramona Forever. Except it's both her and Beezus in the book. And they do it because their shoes are too small. And they can't wear them. They might have both done it in... I wouldn't really remember seeing one pair of shoes. No, I don't remember. Yeah. And and then Ramona is wearing boots, and I think Beezus is still wearing normal shoes. Yeah, so. she's still wearing her, her white yep. party shoes. Yep. All right. Well, that was a whole lot of things that the movie uh, nailed. They they got they really went hard on the details there. Um, all right, we got a few odds and ends, and then we'll get to the final verdict. I think this movie really. Were, I mentioned earlier, I thought this movie was pretty good, um, especially for a movie where not a whole lot happens and there's not much of a plot, and it's just kind of a. The, the quintessential feel good like cute family movie mm-hmm. uh, I thought it worked really well and it's because I thought it, the, the performances are really really good I, I thought both Joey King and uh, who Joey King plays Ramona and um, Selena Gomez did a really good job all the main family all do really yeah. good yeah um, I guess all the all the everybody did good but like those four like had to work really well and I thought they all did really well the mom the dad who I recognized from stuff I couldn't place <laughs> what I recognize him from, but I recognized him from stuff. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, it, but particularly Ramona and um, Beezus, and especially for being, you know, kid actors can be very hit or miss. And I, I thought Ramona was great. Uh, she had a lot of range for such a young age. And I think she was like 10 playing an eight-year-old or something, mm-hmm. but still, she's right was, in that ballpark. I mean, she wasn't playing much yeah, younger Yeah, considering than she, the gaps that there often are for child actors yeah. between their actual age and yeah. the age oh, she they're was, playing, she was right there. She was probably like a year older or something than yeah. like her character, which at that age is the same thing almost. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, I thought they are both... Uh, and it's funny, especially, and Selena Gomez I thought was really good too, and I, I, have, I never watched any of the shows and stuff she was in. Like... Because it, it was kid shows when I was twenty or whatever, you know what I mean? Like it, she was, uh, it was yeah, popular in, when I was in college. I caught quite a bit of her on Disney Channel because my siblings were in the right wheelhouse for it. But because so I always forgot about that. Or I, I always forget that she did that. So to me, I always think of her more as like a musician. Mm-hmm. And so like I always forget that, which is a lot of the Disney people. But like I, I forget that she was like an actress, and I was like really impressed by her in this movie. I thought she did a really good job. Yeah. Um, and especially their dynamic together worked really well. Uh, and again, I, I think <laughs> otherwise the movie would have been terrible if it hadn't, because <laughs> it's like all there is to the movie. So, did you ever get a report card mailed to you? I tried to remember, and I think in maybe in high I school, I think maybe in high school, but they always just handed ours out for the most part. Yeah, I think they usually just handed and ours out. And then you out. were responsible for taking it home. They usually, I thought, yeah, just gave us like an envelope with yeah. it in there or something. I, but I don't remember. It's been so long since I've gotten a report card. <laughs> a report card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because like in college, you didn't get, you, you know, they were just posted online. It was just right. your transcripts or whatever online. In high school, they may have mailed them. Maybe. But I don't remember. I think they may have mailed them. 
Was... But that was in high school, not in elementary school. I'm like 99% sure in elementary school they just gave them to us and we just took them home. Yeah. But it was still like the classic. I don't know about you, but when I was in elementary school, it was still like the classic like little booklet thing yeah, yeah. that you opened. Well, it was, ours was the booklet thing with the and it was the um uh it had the 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 multiple sheets for the um the carbon copy. At least mm-hmm. ours were. They had like carbon so like they they there was like three copies or whatever. There mm-hmm. was like the teacher kept one, they put one in I don't know, you know, where like when they would write on it, it would make like three copies i'm I don't pretty think sure we had that ours were just it was like a piece of um like card stock folded in half oh yeah ours with, with like, like, like grids on it for grades and different uh subjects like different subjects yeah. yeah and then you had to get your parent had to sign it yeah and you had to bring it back yeah. so they could put the next quarter's grades on it yeah ours wasn't like that ours ours were i'm pretty sure like carbon copied like three time like kind of like a bo- booklet but i don't know from my, mm-hmm. it's been again. I don't, I don't really remember, but I remember it being carbon copies because they kept one for their, their, you know, and then you took one home and then you brought it back. I don't know, whatever. Okay, what's the worst grade you ever had to take home? I believe uh, that would have been my senior year of college or high school. I'm fairly certain that I got. It was either a C minus. I may have gotten a D in, in um. This is the only time I'd ever got anywhere close to that because I got I got I had very I've got mostly straight A's all through all the way up through Mm -hmm. high school. Uh, And then senior year, I think I took a calc class and I think in calculus I may have got I think I got a C minus. I may have gotten a D in calculus. Maybe I was always an A, B student. A's and things I excelled at. Yeah. B's and things I didn't excel at. Yeah. I think in high school, I might have gotten a couple higher C's than like math classes because I really struggled with yeah. math. Um, in the third grade, I got a D in handwriting. Oh, I'm surprised. I'm sure I got B's in, in like handwriting because my handwriting was terrible or lower. Like yeah. I, got, I had terrible handwriting, but we also no, we didn't get grades for handwriting. I'm but. thinking back. I'm kind of astonished they gave us actual letter grades yeah. for handwriting. That seems ridiculous. We didn't get grades on it. We didn't get grades for handwriting. I would get notes like they yeah. would like it would be like because it was part of like English or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they would put like I'd get like a, a B or an A in English and then but they would have a note every single time that was like needs to work on your handwriting you know what i mean like that was what See, it was it wasn't surprised, a great i'm surprised they didn't do that more like we got like behavior assessments for like various things you would could get like an e for excels or yeah, and then there was expectations yeah, yeah exceeds expectations and then there was a middle one and you could get like an n for needs improvement yeah, yeah we did stuff like that i, I yeah. don't remember all the grading but yeah, like, I bet my mom still has all my report cards. I, can, I know, I know she does. <laughs> I'm sure my mom has most of our my report cards. I uh, I didn't get straight A's all the way through. I, I just mean I got I got like it was like every other year I'd probably get or every other semester I'd get straight A's and then a semester I'd get a B or two mm-hmm. and then but I, I got really good grades all the way through high school and then most of college but not that that one calculus class i had a terrible teacher and calculus is impossible in my defense <laughs> and she was also a terrible teacher but. once i got to college and i didn't have to take math classes i breezed <laughs> through straight a's are you I, kidding i got an a in calc in college <laughs> uh, i took calc my freshman year and i'm pretty sure i got an a i mean i'd already done it for a semester but uh i also had a much better teacher so give me all english classes i'll show you straight a's <laughs> yeah <sighs> I thought the imagination animation sequences were cool. Yeah, they were neat. They were like well done. They didn't try to keep it too realistic. It's sort of cartoony, but I thought it was yeah. I mean, really it was cartoony without going like too far in the too opposite cartoony, direction. Yeah. It was yeah. almost like a. It almost looked kind of like paper craft or something. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the vibe they were going for. And I thought it. I th- it's one of those things that is. It's one of those styles that I think will age well. Yeah. Like they won't ever look terrible. Yeah. You know what I mean? I agree. Um, because it's not like they weren't going for like whatever the cutting edge mm-hmm. CG at the time was that's going to look terrible in twenty years. Uh, anyways, I thought it was I thought it was neat, and I think it'll I think it'll hold up. Can we talk about the scene where the dad puts an entire egg in his mouth? That's a dad thing. The to whole do. thing that's such at a once. Da- that's such a dad thing to do. That freaked me out. <laughs> I didn't like it. 
I thought he was going to eat it, and he doesn't. He spits it back out and then takes a bite. No, he chews it. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He spits it back. You didn't see him? He puts the whole thing in his mouth, and he acts like he's eating it, but then he doesn't, and he spits it back out into his hand, and then he takes a bite of it. I like thought a normal... he swallowed it, and no, I was horrified. No, no, He like right in a moment after that, he spits it back out into his hand and then takes a bite of okay, it. Okay, that's which is also still weird. gross. It's still though. weird. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying he doesn't like swallow the whole thing or like try to chew the whole thing at once. <laughs> he unhinges like a snake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't eat it like a snake, but I thought this was really interesting. We talked about earlier, like uh, you know, so how how this movie does a pretty good job about of um, some of the harder parts of childhood, and you thought maybe the books did that better. I was still impressed with the movie and thought it did quite a good job of relaying and making relatable uh, sort of vignettes of the different parts of childhood that can be tough as a kid. Um, and we talked about a lot of them earlier, you know, pets dying, parents fighting, moving, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting that I hadn't really thought about recently is how different the prospect of moving is as a child versus as an adult. Yeah. Is as a kid, the idea of moving out of your house to a new house is horrifying and like the worst thing that could ever happen. And now part of that is you got to change schools, which is a little different, right. but still, I mean, you got to when you're an adult, you got to change jobs or whatever. Depending on how far you're going. Yeah, likely, likely the re- one of the reasons you're mm-hmm. moving is that you're changing houses, um, or or you know that you're changing, changing jobs, jobs or yeah. whatever. Um, but that that prospect or the difference in in how that that the prospect of moving is different between a child and adult is something like I said it's not something I really thought about until re- until we were watching this last night because as a kid it's horrifying and terrible and as an adult it's like just a thing that's fine yeah and maybe exciting <laughs> maybe exciting like if you're going to a better opportunity yeah. or maybe it's or like, like moving somewhere you've yeah. always wanted to move like oh or maybe yeah. you've moved eight million times and you're like this again well i mean the, when i say excited, I, I mean the process of moving is always a pain and stressful yeah but i'm not talking about the process of moving i'm talking about the actual once you're done moving you're you know what i mean mm-hmm. like whereas a kid not only is this process stressful but also when they're done they're going to be still right. no, you know yeah. freak like upset and stuff for at least a little while but i, I thought th- that's got to be a weird dichotomy to to experience as an adult but, you know what i mean uh because and so cause i don't have kids but like to be an adult and be oh i'm gonna start this cool new job and we get to go find a cool new house to live in and we're gonna move to the city that i've always wanted to live in because you have all these things that you like as an adult and things that you desire like oh you know like maybe they're moving from the boonies in some boring town to like You know, Mm -hmm. Tacoma, Washington or whatever, like a a bigger city. Maybe they're going to live in a cooler place and there's more stuff to do. And as an adult, this is all really exciting, cool stuff to you. But then you have to remember that at the same time your kid hates this. Yeah. You have to remember at the same time that your kid hates this. And it's just like this weird thing. And it's it's stressful and... And when you're a kid, you don't have any control over it. Yeah, and they don't have any control over it. But it is... Yeah, but yeah, you're right. As an adult, it's ideally it's opportunity and it's exciting yeah. and maybe you're going somewhere better to do something better but yeah. yeah as a kid it's my entire life is being uprooted <laughs> yeah it is it's just fascinating to me that i hadn't thought about that dichotomy because you don't really see that part of it in kids movies where where you're seeing the kids perspective and you don't really in this one either but it's something I didn't think about because in, in kids movies, you're only getting the kids perspective and they're, you know, them being upset and, and, mm-hmm. and you get the parents being like, no, it'll be OK, blah, blah, blah. But we never get to see the parents being like, oh, man, I can't wait when we get the movie. <laughs> like, oh, you know how many nice, how many good restaurants they have in the city we're moving to? I, oh, I was looking the other side of the thing. They have so many breweries. And it's like every week and we can go to a different brewery. You know what I mean? Like I that idea of this, the, that vast a chasm between experiences is was fascinating to me and i hadn't hadn't really considered it before i just want to mention the worst part of this movie which was uncle hobart's horrible awful 2010 the hat. 2010 hat oh the i trilby. hated that hat the tr- i think it's a trilby it looked ridiculous it barely fits on his head i know uh it is a classic um yeah uh, n- <laughs> Nowadays, the character wearing that would not uh, be endearing. No. <laughs> At the time, that was like an endearing cool guy hat. The quirky cool guy hat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not a great look. Uh, my last note that I had is that uh, the movie ends on a da- dance party credits, which is 
classic. <laughs> it's not an early aughts, or, well, this is late aughts, but yeah. uh, it's not an aughts family movie without a dance party. Gotta have credits. a dance party yeah. in the credits. How um, else are you going to end your movie? <laughs> I don't know. They're like, it's the easiest thing. We'll just everybody dance at the rap. We shot this scene last. We got some film left in the canister. Everybody dance for 10 <laughs> minutes. We'll record it and slap it in the credits. It's literally just the cast party. Send, yeah. <laughs> send everybody out on a high note. <laughs> oh, look. Selena Gomez. You know her. She's dancing. Oh, look. Josh Jamel. He can't dance. He's white. Hilarious. Like. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think my last note here, um, there's one moment where Bezos uh, is talking to Ramona about the monsters under the bed. Yeah. And don't come running to me when they're when, <laughs> when yeah. you can't remember if you if Check you checked under the under bed. The bed. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've said that exact thing to Jenna, so <laughs> You cruel Props older sister. for nailing that right there. You cruel, cruel older sister. It's the job of older sisters to be a little bit cruel. Uh, fair. I'll take your word for it. Never been an older sister or had one. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was it for odds and ends. Let's go ahead and hit the final verdict. Now, uh, are you ready for your sentence? Sentence? Oh, but there must be a verdict first. Sentence first. Verdict afterward. So I promise that I'm not just biased because the Ramona series represents a not insignificant portion of my childhood, but I'm going to give it to the books. I thought the movie was good, but overall I didn't think it did as good of a job, like I mentioned, capturing that emotional authenticity of what it's like to be a kid, and especially a quote-unquote annoying, oft misunderstood kid who has a lot of big feelings. I thought the books did a better job with that. There was also something else that really kind of bugged me about the movie as a book reader. I mentioned in the prequel that the Ramona books are very episodic. Yeah. They are. That's just the type of books that they are. And I was wondering how the movie would handle that. And frankly, I don't I don't know how good of a job the movie did. I was kind of chuckling when you were talking about like a checklist, although you meant it differently than I did, with a different kind of checklist. And maybe you can weigh in as someone who didn't read the books. But to me, despite having something of overarching plots in uh, Dad Losing His Job and the um, Aunt B and the wedding plot, mm -hmm. to me it really felt like the movie had set out to string together a bunch of book references, and I didn't think that it felt entirely cohesive. I don't disagree, but I don't think it works to the film's detriment. I thought that the movie, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I thought that it definitely doesn't have a super like cohesive overarching plot. Like I said, it's not really about, there's no big thing other than like the dad's job, kind of. But I thought it worked fine, and I thought for what the movie was attempting to do, it actually worked pretty well. I think the movie could have been 15 minutes shorter. It might have worked even better. I thought the pacing in the third act got a little uh, trudgy. But um, I did think that the, this sort of vignettes... Uh, it's tough to do in a way that's that. It, I, th I think it can be tough to do in a way that feel that feels cohesive and works. But I think the the reason it worked in this movie for me was because the writing and the portrayal of the relationships felt so authentic that it did sort of almost feel like a weird. <laughs> so it's almost like a, a sort of a slice of life, mm -hmm. um, very sort of French film type of thing where there isn't sort of as much of a, a an important sort of narrative going on, um, but we are just sort of diving into the dynamic of these relationships, and I thought they were written well enough in a way, and I and I, not that I disagree that the movie, that the books didn't do a better job of portraying the, what it's like, or sort of what the stuff you said about Ramona and her dealing with... Um, her her personality and 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 not feeling like she's taken seriously and all these sort of things. Not to say the book didn't do it better, but that I thought the movie did a really good job of that. And it like again, I have not read any of the books, at least not that I remember. Uh, and I got that all entirely from the movie, and I thought it worked really well and was really effective for me. Um, and again, I thought the movie was really good. Uh, it's not like great, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was really good, and I thought that it did a good job of 
taking and stringing vignettes together in a way that showed us who these characters were and the dynamics of their relationships and that if you watched this as a kid you would really get something out of it so i thought it was interesting that you said slice of life because that's actually a phrase that i've used to describe the books before i think episodic vignettes works better in books for me I think they can. I, I think, think this movie does it well, but I I'm not saying it doesn't. No, 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 I know. Go ahead. Sorry. I I think that that style of storytelling especially works really well for kids lit uh-huh. because each chapter is almost like its own story and when you're a kid you kind of need those like bite-sized pieces to break things off into. To me, the movie was good but it felt a little bit disjointed. I think this might be one of those potentially rare occasions where having read all of the books maybe did me a disservice. Because watching the movie, I almost felt like I had like a Cinema Sins style counter. Oof, like no, don't don't <laughs> even <laughs> Not not that I'm counting like sins, but for me it was like, oh, that's a thing. Ding. That's another thing. Ding. That's another thing. Ding. Like references to the book. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, I obviously didn't have any experience at all because I didn't know what was in the book, what wasn't. So Mm -hmm. I didn't have that sort of, you know, not nitpicking, but sort of, you know, kind of nitpicking like, oh, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Checklist type of thing. Yeah, I didn't have that experience. So I just kind of watched it and was just like, oh, it's cute. Like, that's fun. Mm -hmm. I liked it. I thought it was good. And like I said, I think it, again, I think if you're presenting this to, if this was made for adults, this wouldn't be a very good film. But I think you can watch it as an adult and still get something out of it. I don't have kids, uh, 32 year old person, uh, and I enjoyed it. Like I didn't dislike watching it. I thought Mm -hmm. it was fun. Um, and, and I thought it did a really good job and I could appreciate what they were going for. And especially for the audience, the movie was made for, I think it, it succeeded brilliantly like for its audience i could see it being like a nine out of ten kids film for uh 30 something eh, it's like a seven six like eh, it's fine you know it's good yeah. it's cute it's fun but yeah i can't compare it to the book so take your word for it that's it for this episode of this film is lit as always you can do us a gigantic favor and head on over to patreon.com slash this film is lit uh, subscribe to us for two five or fifteen dollars a month and you'll see what on uh, all those different levels all the fun stuff you can get uh, you could also, if you can't support us right now, which is fine, we understand, you could do us a, the favor of going to iTunes and leaving us a five-star review and rating. That would also be super amazing. You can also do us a huge favor by going and following us on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads, all those places. Um, Tuesday, when do you put the posts up? Or the not Tuesday, when do you put the polls up? Oh, the polls up that is usually on Friday. Friday. So Friday this week, uh, if you're listening to this episode when it comes out, uh, Katie will have polls up on Facebook and Twitter uh, about you can pick whether you preferred the movie or the book if you watched them. If you only saw one, you don't have to vote or you can vote. You can do whatever you want. Uh, but if you've seen one or read the books, leave a comment. We like the comments. We like to read them on our preview, our prequel episodes. Uh, so do that for us. That would be super great. Katie, what's next? Up next, we have a Academy Award winner patron yes. request. That is one of the things. If you're a $15 patron, you get priority recommendation status. So we will be talking about a movie that I didn't know was a book. I don't think I did. First Blood. Yes. This is uh, the first in a very confusingly named uh, series of movies, the Rambo series. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're trying to figure out what First Blood, if you're not familiar with the series, uh, First Blood is the first movie in the series of movies about John Rambo. Which I had <laughs> no idea was called First Blood. Really, like... Always assumed it was called Rambo? Gun to my head, had you asked me what that movie was called, I would have said Rambo with utter confidence. Uh, I think 90% of people would. Uh, I've actually never seen First Blood. Uh, it's, it's not a series that I ever got into, so I this will be my first time going into it. Um, but yeah, it is. Uh, that is the Rambo series. Yes. Um, and then the second oh, yeah. one, I believe, is called Rambo... So, or, Some Rambo know. something Rambo subtitle uh, First Blood Part 2 Oh Yeah the second okay. one is called Rambo First Blood Part 2 Then we oh, had Rambo Then we had Rambo 3 uh, And then Rambo In 2008 And then 
Rambo Last Blood in 2019. I think that's all of them. Oh. But it, uh, yeah, the naming convention for that series, they really could not get that one going in a way that made any <laughs> sense. I was going to double check that I said that all right. Rambo, Rambo First Blood Part 2, Rambo. Oh, oh, that's the video games. Never mind. Hold on. <laughs> First Blood, Rambo First Blood Part 2, Rambo 3, Rambo, Rambo Last Blood. That's wild. Get it together. <laughs> so we have a bit of a, a genre shift. Yes, a harsh, here. hard right turn. <laughs> hard, yeah, <laughs> hard turn. Hard turn into a uh, gritty action survival movie. So, uh, yeah, that'll be our, uh, we'll do our prequel episode next week. And then in two weeks time, we're talking about First Blood. So until that time, guys, gals, non-binary, and everybody else. Keep reading books. Keep watching movies. And, and keep, keep being awesome. awesome.